You're listening to The Jay Barker Show on Tide 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. Hey, welcome into the program. Matt, Lars. Hey there, Justin. How's everybody today? Y'all hanging in there? You hanging tough there, Lars? Hanging tough, hanging tough. Uh, just trying to wrap my head around this Michigan sign stealing scandal, which uh, we're about ready to dive into. It, it, it's uh, it's more complicated and, and nuanced than uh, I, I first thought it was. Yeah, I mean the reports that are coming out now are, oh, uh, let's see, a staffer, somebody on the Michigan staff attended. They bought tickets to 30 Big Ten games, 11 different stadiums, and they were seen videoing the sideline. So how deep is this, you know, what going to get on on Harbaugh and the Wolverines? Sounds well, pretty bad. It, it, it does. And uh, ESPN had a, just a, you know, the bombshell report yesterday uh, about Connor Stallions, right? And he's he's the the the, the person who has uh, who's sort of at the center of this scandal. Yeah, he's and, like a former Marine captain or something. Yes, like that. yeah, he has a military and, and, background. And, and sources confirmed to ESPN that the stall that Stallions purchased tickets on both sides of the stadium, right across from each bench. For the game on Saturday, oh, last Saturday, Ohio State versus Penn State. That's Michigan's two primary rivals. And Michigan plays both of them in the upcoming weeks. So what, but according to sources, those tickets that were purchased by Stallions were not used on Saturday. But what's the point here? The point is that the Wolverines alleged uh, impermissible in person scouting was going on until very, very recently, like until two weeks ago. And so that compromises the entire season, right? I mean, the entire 2023 season is is, is affected by this. Yeah. And, and look, Michigan, they're undefeated. They are dominating. And they appear to be, you know, uh, on the fast track to certainly, uh, a, you know, a huge showdown, obviously, with Penn State and Ohio State and possibly the Big Ten Championship, possibly the playoffs, possibly national championships. But now, what does the NCAA do? So they have to make a determination on the nature of what the potential violations are. So as I was sort of getting into this, if it's deemed strictly a plain rules case, the NCA Enforcement Committee can basically say, hey, we're not going to touch it. This, this goes to the Big Ten office and we'll let the Big Ten uh, make a, a determination of what the penalty should be. But I don't know that 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 doesn't really seem probable at this point because you don't because the Big Ten has an interest in in having Michigan not not of not derailing Michigan's season, right? Because Michigan is a conference yeah. member. So it's you think it would it's going to be the NCAA, I would think, that um, will uh, make the determination and the uh, the the impermissible scouting, the, the the report has been sent to the NCAA this week and it shouldn't take long for them to review it um and, uh, and and make a decision and so if there is enough evidence of an extensive ongoing uh purposeful attempt to gain a competitive advantage then it's likely that this would be processed as what's called a uh, bylaw infraction case and that increases the possibility of sanctions for michigan and uh and it, it could come down pretty quickly um, and that would it affect them this season? Who knows? I mean, I, I know that uh, you mentioned earlier that there are reporters who are already saying that Michigan, uh, if, if they are found guilty of this, should not be allowed to even play in the Big Ten championship game, much less the NCAA playoffs. But, um, you know, the NCAA typically doesn't act that fast. And I, I don't know. How would, how would television like it if uh, if he, what, and what if Michigan ends up winning the Big Ten, right? And you uh, you then 
would would Fox go for go along with uh, the uh, one of the, the, the like their team basically since Fox owns the rights to Big Ten football by taking them out of the national championship because then you wouldn't have a Big Ten team. And what about ESPN? Because Michigan attracts ratings. They will generate huge ratings at playoff time. So it's uh, there, there's a lot going on here. Jim Harbaugh, of course, has said, I, I don't have any knowledge of this, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, Harbaugh doesn't have much credibility given the fact he's already served a three-game suspension at the start of this season for another NCAA investigation. Right. Um, and that case is uh, that case is going to continue into 2024 with potential for bigger penalties, and um, you know uh, there's just a in there's a, actually a third investigation going on too about the former offensive coordinator at Michigan offensive coordinator at Michigan Matt Weiss who was suspended and then fired last winter. Uh, as it was, they were investigating uh, a, a computer access crime that came out of the Wolverines football facility. And uh, in that case is still being uh, investigated by uh, University of Mich- Michigan Police Department. So <laughs> there's three investigations going on with one program. That whole state's messed up. Yes, uh, with Michigan State and all things that you know what they did with the big screen this past week and much worse earlier uh, in the program from football all the way back to gymnastics and so forth. But Lars, I want to know where the line is. Can a coach from another team go to another team's game and watch them play? Uh, okay, so that's interesting. I am not hundred percent sure of that. But I, you can't use recording devices. Yes, you, that's another coach. Yes, that's yes, not my an, an, another Can coach. A coach go to a game. Yes. and watch another team. Yeah, of course. Okay. Well, it it seems to me in some of the literature, some of the articles I've re- read, that they're not really supposed to do that either. I, I, and maybe I misread that because that just sounds impossible. I mean, they send you game film. You're going to get more off that than you are just sitting there watching. But the intention here, as I understand, and they have video of this guy holding his camera phone up and it's directly pointing at the opposing team or their future opponent sidelines. That's, is that where the line is drawn right there? When you start going electronic on them, is that when they say, uh-uh-uh? Yes. Now, what I'm reading, too, is that the NCAA banned in-person advanced scouting in 1994 because not every school could afford to do it okay. so but but could you then but could you send like a a ga a graduate assistant i i don't know um and could you send somebody who isn't technically affiliated with the program right by letter of the law or whatever uh, that I'm not sure either, but I do know you absolutely cannot use, there, there are rules against using electronic equipment to record an opponent's signals. And, uh, but I guess the, the, the core of the issue for Michigan is called the NCA bylaw 11.6.1, which reads off campus in-person scouting of future opponents in the same season is prohibited. So that is the bylaw that they are talking about here. And so, um, again, Harbaugh's denied any knowledge of it. Um, you know, and what he says, he's, there, he's, he's quickly playing the role of the victim. He said, yeah, there's a target on us. Everybody's been, everybody's been pointing at us for, uh, since the beginning of the season, but our guys are focused. Lars, when he says he doesn't know anything about him, point blank, do you believe him? No. He's lost all credibility. Yep. You know what I see in his future? The National Football League. Yes, I do He's too. He's going to get out of there, and maybe he can hang on and win a national championship. I don't know. Hey, we got a great show lined up for you. Mr. College Football, Tony Barnhart, will join us in about half an hour. Also, in the second hour, we'll talk about the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. No one on this planet knows it better than Hat McWhorter. You're listening to Big Noon Sports presented by Haley Sansing, Union Home Mortgage.
It's 100. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A warm afternoon, the sky mostly sunny, the high today around 80. For tonight, mostly fair with a low at 56. Warm, dry weather continues tomorrow and Thursday. Lots of sunshine both days. Highs between 80 and 83 degrees. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 76 degrees in Tuscaloosa. From T-Town to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. It is indeed on a Tuesday. Did we just kind of skip from fall back into summer? It's supposed to get up to like the 80s later this week. It's crazy weather. But uh, heat is not that bad. Certainly the humidity isn't either. But uh, today's high is going to be almost 80. 79 is the projected high. You heard that from Mr. Spann. You don't need to hear it from me. This is Matt and Lars and Justin. Welcome to Big Noon Sports. Partial uh, portions of our program are being presented by Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama broker, Advantage Realty Group. She will, uh, she'll be with us Friday as we talk football from where else? But then it's free. It's the Friday place to be. And, yes, we will be there this week, this Friday from noon until 2. Again, if you want to dive in here, please do on Michigan-Alabama World Series. It's, uh, we're halfway there. We've got another Game 7 today. Our number is 205-342-9904. Watched a lot of baseball yesterday. I was very pleased with the fact that Arizona was able to beat the Phils 5-1 to one to force a Game 7, and that's just a couple of ticks past 7 o'clock tonight. Meanwhile, loving this too, the Rangers beat the Astros. They started hitting some bombs now, 11-4, to four, and the Rangers are going to the World Series for only the third time in that franchise history, but they've never won at all. So how cool would it be if the Rangers... We're in the World Series, which they are, and ended up winning it all for the first time ever. Meanwhile, after that game, Lars, your favorite manager, the most polite and courteous manager you've (laughs) ever been around, Dusty Baker, has decided that he is going to call it quits with the Astros. Yeah, that's uh, according to uh, a couple of reporters from The Athletic that um, that Dusty has uh, expressed that he's going to step away. And what a career. I mean, he is he's 74, uh, just finished his 26th season in the major league as a manager. Career record of 2,183 wins, 1,862 losses. Uh, he won a World Series with the Astros in 2022. Um, led the Astros a four straight a- ALCS. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's obviously uh, go- he'll go down as one of the greatest ever. But it, the personal legacy for me is when I interacted with him, uh, and I've told this story many times, but uh, I think it bears repeating because it's really strange and odd and one of the weirdest moments of my entire career at Sports Illustrated. But I was out uh, in uh, during spring training out in Arizona working on a story on Barry Bonds, uh, who was playing for the Giants at the time, and and Dusty was the manager and was in in his office after uh, after a spring training uh, game, just uh, talking with him. And uh, in mid sentence, he cut the cheese and didn't even acknowledge it. And it was uh, loud enough that it reverberated in this tiny windowless office. (laughs) And it uh, it perfumed the air, shall we say. Uh, And then he did it again and did it again. Hit the trifecta, Uh, you know, just kind of lean lean to the side mid sentence. And he didn't even stop talking. It was uh, one of the more bizarre uh, interviews of my life. He was quite polite, but uh, you know, didn't say pardon me. Didn't again. Didn't even acknowledge but it. He, I mean, but he did how, how do you, what you wanted? Yeah, he, yeah. He gave oh, yeah. A good interview. Yeah, he was great. He was really nice. Yeah, you know, uh, it sounds like a Saturday Night Live bit. <laughs> I mean, yeah, have somebody even more other than a major league baseball manager, but you know, have, have like the queen or somebody like that do it. I don't know. I'm overdoing well, it. So what? Just the thought in the, every time you tell that I crack up. Now, also, <laughs> to be honest with you, 
I, and I'm a guy, okay? I still think that's funny to a certain extent. Yeah. But every time you tell it again, I get grossed out a little bit more. That's just, <laughs> so absolutely well, no acknowledgement, though, Lars? No just, acknowledgement. <laughs> And no, and you know the toothpick didn't even move, right? <laughs> no acknowledgement, no acknowledgement whatsoever. It was just, uh, it, was, it was startling. Um, it didn't make the story. I guess I, I it could have, but it would be so distracting. I've been a story about Barry Bonds to read about Dusty Baker farting in an interview, but. Um, yeah. So anyway, aside from all that, Matt. Aside from all yeah. that. Aside, you want to get back yeah. to baseball? Yeah. What? Or, uh, what? Just yes. Most embarrassing pooch you've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. I bet we can get some phone calls on that. What's yeah. the most embarrassing? No, we're not going to do that. I promise. No, why? What made Dusty Baker such a good manager? You know, I think he obviously has a huge knowledge and feel for the game. But I've always felt like, and you would know this more than I if you were around him. I always thought he kind of had a player's mentality as a manager since he was a player for 18 years in Major League Baseball for the Braves and the Dodgers. So did you get the feeling when you're in the office waving your hands in front of your face like this? Did you uh, <laughs> did you get the opportunity to see if he was interacting? There was oh, a good yeah. by play between him and his players because that's the biggest thing, I think, in managing baseball. It, that and the, yeah. being able to take care of the bullpen. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, you know, he's a baseball lifer. I mean, literally a lifer, uh, you know, and uh, he, there wasn't much he didn't see. And so he could relate to any issue that a player was going through because he had either gone through it himself or he had been close to somebody who had gone through, you know, whatever it is. And uh, he was just, I think, really good at relating and empathizing with his players on a personal level. Uh, you know, if a player is in a slump, Lord knows Dusty Baker has, I'm sure, been in slumps. He has seen a thousand slumps. And just, you know, he would be someone that you would go to for advice on, hey, what can I do to just to, 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 to shake this thing off? And uh and, and I just, it was always my sense that he was uh, revered by his players, not just liked, but just it, it greatly admired because of his, uh, the, uh, the longevity of both his playing career and his, and his managing career. But can you imagine that just going to the ballpark every day for 40 years, 50 years? Yeah, I, I can't. Like 50. Yeah, fifty years. I, I just that, I know. I know that some people absolutely love covering baseball, but there's no way I would do that. It's a I grind, would not. Man. I would never cover baseball day in and day out. It's a grind, and uh, that's why I have so much respect for Kurt Bloom. As I take just a small detour here, he's been the voice of the Barons for twenty five years now, and so he does all of the games home and away does all the bus rides, does all that kind of stuff. You know, man, that's a grind. He loves it. I mean, he's absolutely, you know, he is, he just loves the game of baseball just like I do. But I'll be honest with you, as much as I love it, I don't know if I could do that. I, only way I could do it is if I'm playing, and we know that's not happening. So, but oop bop But the way parts of these articles read, getting back to Dusty Baker, is that he's leaving the Astros. Is that the way you read it? He didn't necessarily say, I'm retiring from baseball. I'm out of here. See you later. It looked, it read to me like he left it open. Am I wrong? Yeah. he's Yeah. So according to the athletic report, Baker expressed to multiple people inside the organization that this season will be his last as the team's manager. So that's, I guess the door is open. He has talked in the past of, um, of just uh, when he, he'll step away from day-to-day -day aspect of the game of, of managing he would like to uh sort of he doesn't want to remove himself completely from the sport and i think he's it sounds like he's hoping to transition into some sort of front office role um and uh and dusty's wife melissa talked to the athletic and 
And she said, here's the quote, when he is done managing, I know he has a lot of knowledge to offer an, org- an organization, not, not, the, the, not Houston specifically. And she said, I know he can help build a winner. My husband just wants to win and is a winner. So, yeah, there, who knows? I, I, I'm sure basically every team in baseball would love to have him in the front office. You know, um, and uh, and getting into sort of roster management and roster building and and all all those fun things. Well, I would suggest that uh, you know he might take a shot at uh, you know doing some uh, TV work, but I'm I'm not sure that the audio could handle that. <laughs> yeah, and also he's 74. I mean, yeah. and he, he's not. To, to me, he doesn't strike me as a young seventy-four. You know, he he, he, has, tr- he has trouble kind of walking around and fifty and, years you know. of baseball will do that for you. Yeah, it the certainly planes will. And the travel and the hotels and all that kind of stuff. He's a heck of a manager, and he you know he he got the Astros to a championship in twenty twenty two, and that's a very big deal. Not many managers, as many good ones that we've seen, are able to say that. So. Back to the overall picture for the World Series. The Rangers are in. The winner of the Arizona Diamondbacks and Philadelphia Phillies game seven tonight will determine who will represent the National League. Hey, let's take a break. When we got back, got a couple of other things I want to uh, dive into, including I've never heard this before, Lars. You've heard of a two-way player, right? Yes. I mean, that's a guy who plays offense, defense, okay? Have you ever heard of a two-way player in basketball? I'll no. explain it to you because I had to have it explained to me too, so don't feel alone. But it's a very interesting story and it concerns Alabama. You're listening to Big Noon Sports. Join Tide for Big Noon Sports coming up. Also coming up in just a few minutes, we'll be talking with Mr. College Football, Tony Barnhart. A lot to talk about with Mr. College Football. But this is a little college basketball information going into the NBA. Charles Bediaco, Alabama's seven-foot center from last year, decided to go ahead and make himself eligible. He was not drafted, but he was picked up by the San Antonio Spurs. And in the summer league, he averaged 5.1 points and 5.2 rebounds in 13.1 minutes per game. Okay? Well, the NBA is about to kick off, and Bediaco will have a slot on the Spurs roster. However, this is where this new verbiage to me concerning basketball takes place. San Antonio has signed him as a two-way player. That means he has a two-way contract with the Spurs. Each NBA can sign him to three players to two-way contracts. And I'll just read this straight off the page. A two-way player can be moved between the NBA roster and the team's NBA G League affiliate without having to pass through waivers and can play up to 50 games for the big team. So in a sense, what they've done is they've just set up a portal where, you know, you play in New Orleans, then you go to the Spurs. I don't even know where their G League team is. I guess, well, did say, yeah, Las Vegas. So that's the situation. Good for Charles Bediaco. I hope he hangs on and, you know, you know, is the ninth or tenth guy on the bench. I, I kind of see that as his uh, future moving forward. But also, Lars, I'd never heard of a two-way player in basketball. I guess now we have. Yeah, now we have it. I think that's a really good rule because do it doesn't uh, it doesn't it, it, it gives the it, it gives a team like the Spurs uh, security over Betty Ako, uh because you know if you if you want to send him down to the G League to get experience, you then expose him to being picked up by another team, and so it actually it, it favors the player. Because what's the best way to get better and improve? It's to play. And if you are the eleventh guy on the on the on the bench in uh, for the Spurs, you're not going to see much time other than in practice. 
And then, uh, but now with this two being a two way player, you can get plenty of uh, action in the G League, try to improve your game, and then move back up to uh, move back up to the, the 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 big league, so to speak, the NBA team. And I think Betty Ako, he's got a shot to develop into a, a very good NBA player. Uh, he could be, I don't think he's ever going to be super dynamic on offense, but you, that's not really what you need in the NBA from your big man. Uh, the, the game has changed so much. It's a, it's a perimeter game. It's a guard game. It's a guard and forward game. And But you do need that rim protector, and that is what Betty Ako offers. And uh, as soon as he, you know, I think develops a little more physically, and uh, and then and, and and for him, hopefully, he develops a little more uh, on on the offensive side. I think he could really be a a, a strong presence for the Spurs moving forward. Um, but uh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, um, I just got a heads up text. It said that uh, J D. Davison, remember the former Alabama, mm-hmm. really, really good player. He was a two way guy for the Celtics last year. So. Apparently, this isn't brand new. It's at least a year old. But I applaud it. It's a good thing because you, you've got this developing talent. You put them on waivers, and then, you know, s- suddenly they're with the Nets, you know? So that's not going to happen anymore. At least three designated players per team. Um, switching back over to Crimson Tide football, Matt, um, we know it's the, uh, it's the bye week, the open week. Alabama's played eight straight. Now eight straight games. They don't play this weekend. Then they face LSU on November 4th. And uh, Nick Saban was asked about what happens during the bye week uh, when he made an appearance uh, at the Monday Morning Quarterbacks Club in Birmingham yesterday. Yeah, but I think, you know, you want to keep the right um, mindset, you know, during the bye week. Uh, Psychologically, you don't have to focus on a a particular game Uh, but I do think you need to focus on what do we need to improve this is not a time to get uh, relief syndrome like okay I'm just going to go mess around and try to get better at the things I need to get better at Uh, I'm going to try to uh, improve fundamentally the best I can Um, so and physically you know we do an analysis of okay what do we do Workload-wise, this week compared to other weeks, it's 43 percent. We would do if you take from Sunday to Sunday, no, not playing a game next Saturday, not practicing, you know, today, um, only practicing three days, having five days off out of the next whatever eight. Um, they do 43 percent of the workload, so that that should help guys physically recover. But, you know, there's two things to this whole thing. And we do an analysis on all of our players. You get psychologically tired and you think now you get into your feelings about how you feel. Or are you actually physically not able to do the things at the same level you were doing them in the summer, in fall camp, earlier in the season? And we only have one player on our team who is down like 2.9%, everybody else is doing it at at least that level. So they may think they're tired, but it's probably more psychological from game plans and the grind of the season than it is actually physical. Matt, Matt, there's there's a lot to... This guy didn't have it figured out. There is a lot to unpack here. You're right. Um, And the, the, the fact that Alabama can measure the uh the workload and then during the season and then uh and then figure out exactly what percentage of the workload they're going to do during the bye week is pretty remarkable what's even more remarkable is that they test every player to see what their physical capability is now as opposed to what it was at the start of the season and they only have one player who is down 2.9 percent from his preseason physical capability and ability, so that is that is really uh, amazing that uh, that they have uh, so much uh, data on their players and and um, and we we talked about it even before Nick Saban brought it up about 
how I think it's a it's more of a psychological strain. Well, certainly there's a there's a big physical strain, but it's the psychological strain of being a student athlete and 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 just being so busy and it's just go 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 from sun up to well past sundown every single day, and just you just need a, a break. You need to take a deep breath and. Uh, and Coach Saban was also asked, uh, um, he said, uh, he was asked, uh, how does he gauge the energy of his assistants? You know, since he's gauging the physical capability of his players, is he gauging the physical capability of his assistants? And uh, his, his response was, I don't know. Is there an analytical way to show if I need a break? <laughs> he said, laughing. And then he said, uh, I mean, we've all got these young bucks coaching. I know they don't make them like they used to, but you ought to be worried about me, not them. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, uh, you know, he's joking more than ever. Yep. He and I just think he absolutely loves this team, and he loves the challenge of it because, as we have discussed, this is not a perfect team. This is a team that has many imperfections. That is requiring sort of all of Nick Saban's uh, talent and uh, ability to motivate, ability to coach than ever before. And I think you probably could make an argument that this, as of right now, he could be on his way to his best season coaching-wise of his career, and that is saying something. Just trying to get my head around how they measure this. Do they walk over? It's like... When you get your car analyzed to the computer, they got a little thing they just stick in the car and it reads out all that. And they have a little place, a little port on their body that they just plug into and it yeah. measures their heart rate, I mean, their energy. Pay, that's, pay 250 bucks for either. your car. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, all right. Hey, Mr. College Football, you don't want to miss it. Tony Barnhart is coming up next. Brought to you by Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama Broker. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A warm afternoon, the sky mostly sunny, the high today around 80. For tonight, mostly fair with a low at 56. Warm, dry weather continues tomorrow and Thursday. Lots of sunshine both days. Highs between 80 and 83 degrees. I'm James Spann of the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 77 degrees in Tuscaloosa. This is the Big Noon Sports Network. It is indeed. Justin Jones, your producer, Samantha Coulter, and Lars Anderson. Joined now by Mr. College Football, Tony Barnhart. Tony, of course, knows Lars because they're both writers and write books and have written columns and, you know, many articles. And believe it or not, Tony Barnhart and I used to do a TV show for a couple of years over in Atlanta on a small southeastern network. So we have a pretty good relationship. Tony, how you been doing, man? Man, I'm doing great. I'm in here in lovely St. Simons Island. Uh, Georgia, as my fraternity brothers and I get together for the 898th time for the Georgia Florida game, and uh, we're, we're having a grand afternoon. We're, weather's just absolutely beautiful in St. Simon. I want to do a deep dive into that game and other things, all college football. But first, I wanted to check in and see how 19 of Green was doing. Last time we talked to you, it was about to hit the shelves. What has happened? Tell everybody just a snippet of what the book is about and then how well it's going. Well, the 19 of Green tells the story of my high school football team in the fall of 1970, you know, roughly 87 years ago. And where we, it was the first integrated team in my school's history, a black school and a white school merged to create the team. And when all was said and done, we only had 19 players, 12 white, 7 black. And it's a story of that season. It's about football, but it's also about friendship, and the friends we made, and, and the, you know, it was a tough time uh, from a race race, race relation standpoint. And uh, But anyway, the bottom line, the book's been out since October 15th, and we've got several signings lined up, and I'm just, I'm very, very pleased with the way it turned out. Tony, what was your uh, writing process like? Did you go back and uh, and talk to your your teammates? 
Yes, my, there of the, of the original nineteen players on our team, fifteen of us are still alive, and I interviewed the other fourteen guys. Twelve were in person, uh, and and we had a couple of we had a little bout with COVID that slowed us down a little bit. But I interviewed all of the living players, and then family members of the players who aren't living, and uh, the coaches who were living, and their families, and administrators, and their families, and uh, yeah, it was a. And just the process of doing the book was incredibly satisfying because not many of us get a chance to go back and reflect on our lives and re- you know and talk to all these people who were part of our lives growing up. So yeah, I was I was very pleased with that. Yeah, just thinking about that, that's really cool. I mean, you get you yeah. had you were able to put together a little football reunion, <laughs> a well, high school football uh, yeah, reunion. And, and the fascinating thing about it, guys, is, is that our quarterback uh, was Charles Turner, who came over from the black school, and we were told how good this guy was, and, and we had no idea. So, uh, one of my teammates asked, well, when did you know Charles Turner was going to be your quarterback? And our, our center, Tommy Moon, said the minute, the minute he walked off the bus, we knew he was our starting quarterback. And he was – Charles went on to have a, a great success as, co- as a coach and administra- high school administrator – He's in four different halls of fame. Uh, got a free agent tryout try with the Dallas Cowboys. And he today, 52 years after we first met, he remains one of my best friends. Tony, uh, on, on to the, the topic of the day in college football, and that is the sign-stealing scandal at Michigan. What do you, uh, first off, what do you think of it? And two, what do you think the fallout is potentially going to be? Well, obviously, there there are specific rules about stealing signs and all that. But this this the more and more I read about it is how elaborate it was. You know, the, the principal involved bought tickets at eleven different stadiums and things of that nature. I mean, my goodness! Uh, and so, obviously, you know, to me, the smart play, of course, would be to get the technology into the helmets like the NFL does, like the civilized world does, and let's get, get it over with. But, yeah, I, I, I think the fact that it was that – it's one thing you send a guy out to scout a team and he shouldn't be doing that, but it's another thing when you've got this vast network of, of, of tickets bought and things of that nature. So I, I, I don't know what the result is going to be because it's something uh, new. Is that we, don't, we don't really have – the books don't really tell us the rule book doesn't tell you really tell us what should be done but i think it's uh it is absolutely a serious issue this is the week it's the world's largest outdoor cocktail party i don't think i'm supposed to call it that anymore what are they going to do Sue that's me? okay i do uh, yep. i do too i mean i, I do that with Bedlam and all the other ones too the red river shootout is uh, really the red river rivalry now i don't I don't know, Tony. Yeah. I think you uh, we're all from the same school. And really, come on, people. We got better things to, to worry yeah, about. We, but we, we know, what's, we your know favorite, what what's your favorite memory as a student going to that game? Well, so many, obviously, the, as, as a student, uh, with, there was a game, this, the um, 75 game when I was a student. Georgia had a, had a play in its arsenal where the tight end – they would put the tight end and they would swing him around and hand the ball to him on sort of a jet sweep. A guy named Richard Appleby, a great, great athlete. And Georgia ran that play all year long. But then they played Florida, who was favored to win. Georgia trailed seven to three and they ran the end around to Richard Appleby. But this time he stopped and he threw it. Uh, to a guy named Gene Washington, who was who was a candidate for the Olympic team's incredible speedster, and he caught it for an 80-yard touchdown, and Georgia won the game 7-3. I wasn't at that game. I couldn't afford to go, but I, I was in a big bar in Athens, and they damn near tore the place down. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. Um, Tony, your thoughts on Alabama this season and uh, and where Alabama goes from here. Obviously, it's a bye week for Alabama and a kind of a, a time just to reflect and pause and, and get healthy. Uh, and LSU comes to Tuscaloosa on November 4th. But uh, just your, your big picture assessment of Alabama. I think Nick Saban has done one of the best coaching jobs of his career. 
because when you think back about where they were when they played South Florida and nothing was working uh, and it looked uh, like a near disaster, like the great coaches do, Nick Saban got his staff together and said, guys, we are making this game way too complicated, okay? Let's figure out what our quarter. First of all, Jalen Milrow was our quarterback. Okay, now let's figure out what Jalen can do and do that. And then we have a we have a really good defense, and we will build around that. And he, I think they've done they've done a tremendous job. And that doesn't mean they're going to win the rest of the games, but I think for the way they started and the, the fix they found themselves in, I think he Nick Saban showed why well, he's the greatest coach of all time. Tony Barnhart, Mr. College Football, is our guest here on Big Noon Sports. Have you noticed, as all of us have, uh, I, I think that there is now a softer side of Nick. Now, there's the same old oh. Nick is still there now. I mean, he, he can still come at you and, and get hacked off, as has Terry on Arnold. But why is, he, why is he softer now, Tony? I think a lot of us, Matt, as we get older, we, we have our softer side sort of emerges. And, he's, and also, I think, again like the great coaches do. He says, you know what? I don't need to treat this team like I've treated some of my other teams. This team, you know, some some players need a kick in the butt, but that some players need a hug, all right? A hug and an assurance that they're okay. And I think I think he's having a lot of fun with this team uh, because so many people wrote him off early and they are overcome they're overcoming a lot and I thought that was priceless. But they had the cigar after the game against Tennessee on Saturday. He just took it and said, okay, put it in his mouth and walked away. And the, the, Nick Saban would never have done that before this year. Uh, skipping over to Georgia, losing Brock Bowers, how, how big is that injury? And, and just to, what have you seen from Georgia and uh, their improved play, at least it appears to me? Well, Georgia has only lost the guy who I think was the best football player in America. Uh, this this guy is extraordinary for what he can do and what he adds. Now, you don't replace him, and everybody understands that. What you do is you get, hey, we need a little bit more from you, and we need a little bit more from you, and we need a little bit more from you. You guys are going to have to pick up the slack. Uh, you don't replace a guy like that. And so I, I still think Georgia, despite the loss of Bowers, Despite the fact that th- this team is not as good as the last two Georgia teams, but they still are good enough to win every game on their schedule, and I, I still think they're in, they're on track to do that. And now, the, the, it's funny when the in the season started, we're talking about how easy Georgia's schedule was. Well, I'm sitting here looking. Florida, who just came off a big win, uh, Missouri on November fourth, Ole Miss on November eleventh. At Tennessee on November eighteenth, that schedule looks a little more daunting than it did before. Tony, I hope I still yeah. got you. Yeah, I'm still okay. here. You're there. Yep. You're there. Um, sometimes this technology gets in the way, Mr. Barnhart. All right, uh, tough question, but I, I value your response. When do you think Nick Saban will retire? He will retire, and the conversations I've had with him over the years, he will retire when one of two things happen. And they're, and they're both related, obviously. He senses that recruiting is dropping off, that the message is not getting there, and then they don't win as much. You know, so I remember sitting in Steve Spurrier's office in South Carolina. He said, he said I am not going to stick around here and be a 7-5 and five coach. Well, guess what? He got to a situation where he was headed flat out to seven and five, and he decided to step away. I think the same thing with Saban. He's not winning, and recruiting is not going. And you know what? Coaches know, coaches know before the rest of us when recruiting is starting to slip. They know. And I think if he thinks recruiting is starting to slip, which means the same thing with Coach Bryant. At the end, Coach Bryant knew he wasn't getting through to the players in recruiting. Uh, he, you know, For example, he couldn't believe he lost Bo Jackson, okay, to Auburn. He he, that was a sign for him. Yep. So I, I think that's when Nick Saban gets out. But right now, he Nick Saban loves to coach ball. He just absolutely loves. It. Now all the other stuff he has to put up with, he doesn't like. But when it comes to coaching ball, the guy still loves to do it. Yeah, and he's uh, been quite successful. 
Would it absolutely floor you if Alabama won it all? Oh no, because this is this is a team. This is this is not a team that's going to dominate everybody they play like they used to. You know, that, that was one thing Saban said to me. He said, you know, he said we just don't beat. You know, it used to be people didn't like to play us because by the fourth quarter we were beating up on them pretty bad. So we don't do that anymore. I said, but while that is true, you still have the ability to win every single game you play. So no, it would not shock me if Alabama won the national. Hey, uh, get back to your buddies down there in St. Simons Island. It's a beautiful place, and that's where all the elite Georgians go before this game, Tony. (laughs) All right. Tony Barnhart has been our guest first hour. Coming up, more of Big Noon Sports presented by Haley Sansing, Union Home Mortgage. TBC Tuscaloosa and W265CG Tuscaloosa, a town square media station. Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. From the Fox Sports Studios in Los Angeles. Here's Monsi Bolaños. No practice today for Titans quarterback Ryan Tannehill due to his ankle injury. Head coach Mike Vrabel says that if Tannehill can't play week eight, he anticipates both Malik Willis and Will Levis playing against the Falcons. The Cardinals are placing three-time Pro Bowl tight end Zach Ertz on injured reserve with a quad strain that he suffered during their game on Sunday, according to the NFL Network. The plan is for him to return this season. The Rams have released veteran kicker Brett Maher. And the regular season of the NBA tips off tonight with a double header. It all starts with the Nuggets hosting the Lakers at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. Then the Suns will take on the Warriors in San Francisco. The Athletic is reporting that Phoenix star Bradley Beal is unlikely to play tonight due to his back ailment. And the Clippers have announced that they will be playing their season opener tomorrow against the Portland Trailblazers without Terrence Mann. He sprained his left ankle during yesterday's practice. Covering SEC sports like Kudzu on the roadside. This is Big Noon Sports. Back on Big Noon Sports. Gotten out of halftime. Saban's giving his team a big talk. Interesting read on AL.com about an interview with Jalen Milrow. And he said something, I think, very interesting He said that during the season, Saban has continued to instill his, meaning Coach Saban's, confidence in the team. I don't know if I've ever heard it described that way, but I don't find that anywhere, any shape, form, or fashion hard to believe. That's kind of what Saban does, isn't it, Lars? Yeah, um, that's really interesting. Could you read that quote again? It said uh, Saban, he said he, referring to Saban, instilled his confidence, Saban's confidence, into us is the quote that I read on AI. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I know that he said that uh, after the Tennessee game, and um, I, I think with this team, Nick Saban has had to take, and, and we've seen this on the sidelines, we've seen it throughout the whole season, uh, more of a kid gloves approach, right? And he has talked about how you know, some some teams need to be uplifted and some teams need to be, you know, uplifted with uh, a, a helping hand, so to speak, metaphorically. And some teams need kind of to be punched in the face uh, to <laughs> to wake them up, to get them to play at their best. And and I think uh, he's been a little softer with this team, just trying to get them to uh, just this, like I said, to fill them with with confidence. Um and I, again, when I, if, if things go like Alabama fans hope and like Nick Saban hopes, and he ends up winning the national championship this year, it would be without question in my mind his best performance at Alabama because he's doing it with, uh, with a roster that frankly isn't as deep as in years past. Uh, doesn't have the talent uh, on the, the skill possessions, skill positions on offense that he's had in years past, and you know every game is a is a, a, a fist fight and it's a slugfest. You know, it's just it's a grind. Nothing's easy for this team, which is why I find them eminently likable because you can relate. 
because life is a struggle. Everything is a struggle. And uh, for Alabama for so long, it is they've made it look so easy because the talent and the coaching have been so, so superior. Well, now that the talent is, uh, is, is down, the coaching seems to have risen. And uh, it's, it's really a, a fascinating team to, to watch and to analyze and to see evolve. I don't know if I can remember, Matt, a team sort of change so much from game one, game two, game three, to where we are now, game eight. And uh, it's definitely changed for the better. Yeah, you know, and all of the things you were uh, you were just talking about and the job that he's done, and now Jalen Milrow's coming out and talking about how he's instilling confidence. Goes back to what Tony Barnhart told us about 10 minutes ago and says, if this continues, exactly what you said, Lars, this may be his best effort ever as a college football coach. And I'm not sure that I would disagree, but it does bring to mind and probably going to sound down a little um alabama seems to be lacking talent and i know they're lacking depth and a lot of that's due to the nil but lars since saban has been there at least over the last 10 12 years they've had either the number one number two maybe the number three recruiting class in america why is the talent level down other than nil that can't be the only reason Transfer portal, I should say. Transfer I think, portal. Yeah, transfer portal. Uh, I think sometimes recruiting analysts and Nick Saban just misses on players. Um, and uh, th- that's the reason why Alabama is starting a true freshman at left tackle. And, and uh, you know, uh, why Alabama doesn't have an elite wide receiver right now after years of having a, a wide receiving core that was better than half of the wide receiver cores in the NFL. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it, it happens. Look at Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick, who is the de facto general manager of the New England Patriots, I think in the last 20 years, or maybe, I'm sorry, the last decade, he has drafted all of two Pro Bowl players, a punter and a punt returner. <laughs> so uh, it just shows you that, you know, it, it happens to the best of them. Speaking of the best of them, Derrick Henry is trending on Twitter right now. Why? Because there's a lot of speculation that he is going to get traded before next Tuesday's 4 p.m. Eastern trade deadline. Because um, on, on Monday, the Titans traded uh, Kevin Byard. Uh, a safety to the Eagles. He is arguably one of the top three safeties in the league. And so it raises the question, are the Titans now just kind of in fire sale mode uh, because their season appears to be lost? And um, and Derrick Henry is going to be a free agent uh, at the end of the season. So he's 11 games away from, from walking away from the team because I, I, the, I don't believe that Henry is in the Titans' long-term plans. And so you you may, the general manager of the Titans, may want to see, to see if he can get some draft capital before, uh, before uh, um, uh, Derek hits free agency. And, and so, look, it shows, like, the, the fact that they traded their best safety shows that they are, they are in the selling, the selling mode. And a team like the Ravens, could use him, uh, Rams, uh, Bills. Man, he would uh, be scary with the Ravens. Uh, I mean, uh, the scary. Browns, the Browns, um, or you know, Packers. maybe nothing will happen. But I, I'm just, uh, I would not be surprised if King Henry is moved soon. Did you see who beat the Packers this past weekend? Yeah, Dude, Jordan, Denver. Jordan Love, Denver. Jordan yeah. Love, Jordan Love. Uh, <laughs> wow! The first couple of three games. Of the yeah, game, but he's been hor- he's been so he's much. been horrible the last few I, weeks. I got I, my I, hopes up. I, I, I don't know if he's the long term answer. I thought he was initially. Not so much now. Coming up, let's talk to uh, Mister World's Largest Outdoor Cocktail Party. I guess he he would be the president of the club. That's Hamp McCorder, son of longtime SEC Commissioner Boyd McCorder, is coming up on Big Noon Sports.
Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A warm afternoon, the sky mostly sunny, the high today around 80. For tonight, mostly fair with a low at 56. Warm, dry weather continues tomorrow and Thursday. Lots of sunshine both days. Highs between 80 and 83 degrees. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 79 degrees in Tuscaloosa. The best sports talk in Alabama. This is Big Noon Sports. It's Lars, Matt, Justin. Thank you for dialing us in for Big Noon Sports. Many of our interviews are sponsored by Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama Broker Advantage Realty Group. We'll be with her Friday afternoon at Innisfree. And if he's anywhere within 15 miles of it, so will Hamp McCorder, if I know him. Hamp likes to have an Irish pub beer every once in a while. Hey, Hamp, what an awkward intro. How you doing? I, I've had worse. I've had worse. Good afternoon, gentlemen. <laughs> oh. Hey, it sounds like you're on the road. What have you been up to? Uh, nothing much. I will be heading down to uh, St. Simon's Jacksonville tomorrow um, for my 38th straight Georgia-Florida game, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we just talked to Barnhart. You'll run into him. He's on the same island. Oh yeah, it's uh, well, you run into a lot of Georgia folks down there, so it's a uh, it's a good time. I you know, I, I guess it's pretty much Georgia and Florida and Texas, Oklahoma and A and M and Arkansas that have the neutral side games. I you know, tradition. I don't like the made up ones, but I do like these. Um, I miss Alabama Auburn. I don't blame Auburn for moving it. They had to, but I think it did. It lost. It's not. It's not unique anymore. I guess at the point. What's your favorite memory of uh, of the cocktail party? Well, it would be the one I didn't go to, which would be Lindsey Scott. Um, but my favorite one, I, I mean, that when you win, it's just such a good time. When you lose, it is. But, I mean, you have a blast. I always tell people, um, everybody talks about Texas and Oklahoma. And I go, well, when I was eight, I'd rather go to the state fair. But now that I'm of age, I'd rather go to the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. Um so it's it's a it's a great time. I think that it's I think it actually helps George in recruiting. I don't think it hurts him and you know, I know Kirby might beg to differ, but he's had a top two or three recruiting class every year he's been there, so it doesn't seem to be too detrimental. No. George is pretty good. I certainly don't need to alert you to that. But um can you kind of paint a scene for it? I mean, why tell us why it inherited or actually was awarded the uh, the title the world's largest outdoor cocktail party how I've never been it's a bucket list thing for me how crazy does it get I think it's like most things it's not quite as crazy as it used to be um, I mean the stories I used to hear you know years ago and when I first started going you, you know the Gator Bowl was you know just a different type of play, old old stadium and you would you had the kind of like uh, Legion Field has that big walkway around the field where they brought a, they rolled out a little tunnel gate so the teams could get on the field and it would, you know, block the fans from going. Well, the bourbon is just dripping through that little tarp on top. I mean, it's just covering you on the head. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just debauchery with a football game in the middle of it is what it amounts to. <laughs> That's a great uh description i like that um hey what, what are your thoughts on georgia this year and uh and you know just have they played up to their potential uh what do you see georgia doing moving forward especially without brock bowers for these next couple of weeks you know i don't they're kind of like everybody else in the country it looks like i guess with the exception of michigan who's blown out everybody but their schedule has been weaker than georgia's um I don't think they're as good defensively as they've been, but the flip side is, you know, if they jump on somebody offensively, then all of a sudden I think George's weakness is, you know, taking away the run. But if you're up 17 nothing, you've pretty much done that. Um, you know, I think it'll be difficult. You know, it's one of those things that is collective. If next five games, I think George's going to lose one, I would say probably about a 30 or 40% chance. If you're asking me which one, I don't know. Um, I do know they've won 40 out of 41, which is the best streak in the history of this league. So I'm happy no matter what. Yeah, you're a happy bulldog. Has uh, 
this team can win without Brock Byers. You hear a lot of people kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but, you know, they also have a couple of other tight ends that are extremely talented, but no one's Brock Bowers. No one's Brock Bowers, but, I mean, it's, you know, Kirby's modeled his program after Alabama, and, I mean, Brock Bowers gets hurt. I'm not sure Bowers is a five-star. Of course, that was COVID evaluation, but I got two or three tight ends that are all four-stars. So, you know, it, they weren't going to have Bowers next year, so you just kind of go. I mean, he, he does make a difference. You just got to be a little bit more efficient. Um, I think our quarterbacks played really, really well. Um, I think we're more of a throwing team than a running team. Uh, we, our pass protection has been excellent. We're not this great running the ball. But, you know, you, you're solid, and when you look at it, we got better players and I personally think better coaches than anybody left on our schedule. So... Sticking with your quarterback, Carson Beck, uh, what have you seen out of him from uh, the start of the season to now? I think Georgia was fortunate that the way their schedule lined up the way it did. I mean, I supposed to play Oklahoma, but you know, but I think they just kind of eased him into it. And now I think he has a lot of confidence going to Auburn and winning. Your first time starting on the road, I don't – I mean, I've – been to a lot of places in this league, and that's still, to me, the, the toughest place to play when they get it rolling of any, any place in the conference. And so I think that gave him a lot of confidence. And, you know, now you're setting up where you've got Florida as a neutral site. you got Missouri and Ole Miss at home, Tennessee on the road. I mean, it doesn't set up – you know, I think you're lucky to have Missouri and Ole Miss at home. And I think the team that's going to beat Georgia is going to have to score probably 30 points to do it. I'm not sure Tennessee can. And uh, how about Alabama? Uh, you obviously pay attention to the Crimson Tide very closely, like all of us. Uh, yes. uh, your just analysis of what you've seen from Alabama this year. Well, I think Coach Saban is doing a heck of a job. I think he you know, probably put 10 years on his life. I think the best thing that happened to them, I mean, you lose to Texas and then you play like garbage against South Florida and all of a sudden – all the fans' expectations were gone. And now they're just happy to win. You know, it used to be Alabama had to be up 35 nothing at halftime for anybody to be happy. Now they're very ecstatic whenever they win. So I think that's been a great benefit to them. I think there's some pressure off. They're just, just go win a game. And so, you know, until somebody knocks them off uh, in the West and then, uh, you know, quite frankly, in the SEC championship game, they're still Alabama. Our guest is Hamp McCorder. I want to go back into your childhood a little bit because uh, I think people recognize your last name. Your father was one of the best commissioners we've ever had. My personal favorite because he treated me with such respect. And really, you know what? To be honest with you, I just liked your dad. He was a good guy. Um, hey, hey, real quick, speaking of that, I, just right before I came on, I ran into Clyde Bolton. I know you know Clyde. Yep. Yep. So I ran into him and spoke to him for a few minutes, kind of a blast from the past. So he's he's 87. He looks good. Um, so anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. If you're talking about older listeners, they'll remember yep. Mr. Bolton. Yeah. Um, was he still driving a Miata? He was Fine. sitting and eating. He was eating, and I was okay. walking the dog. And I had a George shirt, and I said, go dogs. He said, and I recognized that grovelly voice. I go, Mr. Bolton? So we talked for a few minutes, but anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt. Good man. No, I'm I'm glad to hear about it. But uh, when he retired, he bought a Miata, and then he started uh, loving it so much that he would get one every so often. And to see him cruising around in that little sports car with the top <laughs> down, wearing that touring hat with that slow <laughs> Georgia draw, he's he's a delightful guy to be around. I'm, I'm glad to know he's still doing very well. Okay, yeah. back to your youth. When did you realize, hey, my dad's something pretty special? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I can remember when he got the job when I was five, and I was, I was a football junkie even at that age, and I knew things, but I didn't know quite how everything worked. And I was at the first little meetings there, and I was introduced to Coach Jordan. And said hello, and then uh, as I was walking away, probably where he could hear it, I was like, can I go meet Coach Bryant now? So, you know, I, I probably wasn't the wisest thing for a kid to say at that time, but 
I, I don't know. It, it's it was weird because he didn't he wasn't supposed to pull for anybody, and I didn't understand how he, you could watch a game and not pull for somebody. And then I did realize later on that there was a reason why he didn't go watch Georgia play conference games because he couldn't help pulling for Georgia, so he just didn't put himself in that position. What were some of the biggest issues your dad faced as the commissioner of the SEC? To the one that, that sticks out the most um, that I remember kind of late in his career was Florida in the SEC championship in 84, um, where they had brokered a deal. Florida had some players that got granted immunity to, to testify against NCAA, so in theory, they were still eligible, and they negotiated that they could still win a title but not go to a bowl game, and then that was what was agreed upon, and then people went back and voted to strip it away. I can remember that. Early on was the officials. The officials used to be run out of Atlanta by this group, and Dad tried bringing in a conference office, and that was when Coach Bryant stepped up and stood up for him, and that helped a lot. So, you know, I think there was about a million and a half dollars dispersed with Dad's first year, like 17 in his last. So the issues weren't quite as drastic as they are now. Still, uh, for the time, that's a pretty big increase. Uh, well, it, I mean, percentage-wise, it, it's yeah. the highest, but, but only $16 million. It, That's chump change these days. Oh, no kidding. It's unbelievable. Do you remember him? Because that he was there when they started really getting to the high-dollar TV money. Do you remember him getting into the negotiation there, or did some of that happen after no, I can remember, you know, because Georgia and Oklahoma sued the NCAA and won the TV, you know, the rights to the TV, and immediately the CFA and the conferences could negotiate their own deal. And I can remember him negotiating the deal with Ted Turner at TBS and Bob Wessler, old names for a long time ago, that first, you know, 11, you know, 11 to 30 game or whatever it was back then. Um, it turned into the Jefferson Pilot Dirty Window and the rest of them. But I can remember that. I remember basketball deals, um, that sort of stuff. And the SEC basketball tournament was a big deal. So, and then I guess the, the deal with the Sugar Bowl happened the first time in 76. So, those are some of the things I remember. Hamp, can you hang on before you take off for St. Simons for maybe 10 more minutes? Yeah, yeah no problem. And McWhorter is our guest on Big Noon Sports. It's down to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. Our guest is Hamp McWhorter will be attending the Georgia-Florida game this weekend down in Jacksonville. Um, I know he'll be having a big time. Is it 38 consecutive years? That'll be, that'll be it for me. I've been to – now the Auburn series, I've actually been to 44 straight. So a wow, little, bit, be, little bit better record against Auburn than I do Florida. Um, I do remember calling you when you used to have a – scoreboard show on Saturday. I called you at halftime of the Georgia Florida game one year. That was a very interesting conversation, Ham. Yeah. I, 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 I was uh, not as sharp as I could be, could have been. That all depends on who's listening. I thought you were sharper than every knife in the drawer because it was just <laughs> funny. Because if I remember correctly, Georgia kind of jumped on Florida, didn't they? I think that so, but I think uh, I will say this, being my 38th straight, they kind of all blur together, um, literally and figuratively. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's a great atmosphere, half and half. Um, it, you know, it's, I, I just enjoy that environment. It's, it's, uh, it's just a fun game to go to. And, you know, for Georgia people, not really like but, you know, South Georgia is pretty far away from Athens. And so that was how the game kind of ended up down there was uh, kind of throw a bone uh, to the South Georgia people to have one game that's easy for them to get to. And so I just, you know, 
I think it'll have to go away for a couple of years because they redo the stadium, but I, I think it's going to stay there for a while, which I'm I'm happy about. I know the SEC wants it to stay there as well. So, but anyway, what what is the backstory of uh, of how that game landed at the at the neutral site there in Jacksonville? I think that was really it. I mean, they're playing in Gainesville and Atlanta and Macon and that, you know how back in the day, but 1933 it. it it ended up there, and I think it was mainly because the South Georgia fans wanted to have a game they could get to that was close, and obviously Florida's not going to complain about a game 70 miles away from their stadium, and they're just you know, kind of stuck. And like I said, it's Florida, so the, the, the laws were a little bit looser than in, in, in Georgia. <laughs> and, I mean, they used to have, the, have these brick walls around the Gator Bowl that had openings in it, and people would just... If, when, they, when they finally started frisking you, which took a while, they just go set their bottle over there on the brick wall, go in the game, walk over there and get it and go on in. So it's been it's been that way forever. Um, but, you know, like I said, I, I enjoy it. We're losing just about all of our traditions in college sports, which I get. But I, I hope they keep a few of them. Can you drink there now? I mean, you can buy a beer for $18 or whatever it is. Yeah, you can you can get a beer at a rock bottom price there, or you can sneak airplane bottles in, whichever one you prefer. Um, not that I'm advocating that sort of behavior, um, <laughs> but uh, it's it is a little bit less expensive if you if you can get the airplane bottle in. <laughs> um, how do uh, Georgia fans? And this may sound like a kind of a stupid question. How do they view Kirby Smart? Because right out of the gate, it seemed that there was some skepticism about Kirby. Uh, but now, is he sort of, uh, after winning back-to-back national championships, and, and you said, uh, what, 40, 41 of the last 42 games or something, um, uh, is, is Kirby going to be in Athens for as long as he wants to be there? I can't imagine. You know, Lars, you know this, and Matt, y'all have been around long enough. You don't ever say that because you, you you don't know what can happen. I mean, there are things that crop up. You know, some sometimes of a not of a coach's doing. You know, uh, I would have thought Pat Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald would have been at Northwestern by as long as he wanted yeah. to. And yeah. So I mean, I think short of something like that, yeah, I, I think the skepticism with Kirby early on was, you know, he'd never been a head coach. We really didn't interview anybody else other than Kirby. Um, but I mean, right now he's, I mean, you know, he's the Jordan, he's a God to Jordan people. I mean, he wait, like I said, the, uh, the Jewish people only wandered 40 years in the desert. We wandered 41. So, <laughs> you know, he, he is, he is our Moses. Um, uh, you know, he just, he just is, he went back. I mean, the first was great. We went back to back. We're now. You know, it, it's we're playing with house money, and you know, it's it's just it, it's it's an amazing. Like I said, forty out of forty-one, um, twenty-four straight games, twenty-three straight SEC games. Uh, it's just hard to fathom that this that this is happening in Georgia. Hey, is Stetson Bennett still with the Rams? I don't even know if he's clo- holding a clipboard, but that guy you know, went he- y'all. To the to two straight national championships. What's he there's doing? no question. He, he um he got. I, I don't. To be honest with you, Matt, I don't know what all the circumstances are. He um he he's on the roster, but I I I, I don't know what it is. I think it's a mental health issue that he has. But I, this is just speculation. I mean, it's one of those things where he got put on one of those inactive lists and. You know, Sean McVay said something like, we just want the kid to be get healthy. So I really don't know what's going on with Stetson, to be honest with you. Um, he's having a pretty good camp out there, but, you know, who knows? But, yeah, he's – it takes a lot for, for Georgia people. I mean, he kind of acted a little bit immature after winning the second one, which is amazing considering he's almost as old as I am. But, uh, <laughs> you know, he – I just hope you know. I just hope he gets ready. But I mean, Georgia people are gonna, you know, think highly of him no matter what. He can always go back to Blackshear, Georgia, and make a killing selling insurance if that's what it comes to. 
Yeah, and uh, what a college career. But, uh, and, and yes, he, he was placed uh, on September 13th on the non-football injury slash illness list. And uh, Sean McFay, he was pretty vague about the reason for it, but he just said that uh, Stetson needs to focus on things a little bit bigger and more important than football. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, he played pretty decent in the preseason uh, when he got his chance. But, you know, it, it's, it's crazy to think that uh, a quarterback who wins back-to-back national titles and then you bring Carson Beck in and you would argue that that's actually a uh, an improvement in, in terms of just raw physical ability. W- would you agree with that? Oh, raw, raw physical ability. I'd say classic quarterback ability, yes. Um, Stetson's athletic ability was what was a game changer. And, you know, you talk to people in the business, I know y'all have, you know, they just talked about how he seemed to get them on, in the right play every single time. And even when a bad play was called, his legs could get him out of it. Um, the, the amazing thing to me, Lars, is is uh, you sit there and you follow recruiting, and everybody, all Georgia and Alabama has are four and five stars everywhere, and Georgia ends up winning a national championship back to back with a walk on quarterback. So, <laughs> yeah, go I mean, figure. It just, you know, it just doesn't make much sense, but you know, you know, Br- Purdy was the last pick in the draft, and Tom Brady was a sixth rounder. So, you know, it's just. It, it just happens to be, you know, sometimes it's just fortunate what situation you fall into. Yeah, it's just one of the main things that we just love sports about. Um, man, does does sports in America love an underdog? I think Oh, God. No, there's no just... question. Although, it doesn't take long. I'm sure everybody was really, really tired of Stetson by the end. Because it was the, you can only hear the underdog walk on story so many times before you go, okay. Now, as a Georgia fan, can't hear it enough, but other people yeah. can. Will, ever, will, there ever be, will there ever be a statue of Stetson Bennett outside of uh, the stadium? I doubt I doubt it. might be a small one, um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> there'll be one at Kirby here pretty soon, I would think. I would think yeah. so. It's my understanding that an artist is making one now that favors you to set outside the stadium. <laughs> On Saturday, <laughs> with thirty-eight no, that, in a row, <laughs> that, 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 that people will be throwing things and probably have handcuffs on it, so that probably wouldn't be a good good one to have. <laughs> so your statue would be you over the back of a police car with your hands yeah, yeah. behind your back. Okay, <laughs> possibly. I'm, I'm not can't, can't confirm nor deny that. I don't think that's going to happen. Have a good time, Ham. Always good catching up with you. Thanks, Thanks Ham. Matt. Thanks, Lars. Y'all have a good one. You know. Um, Lars, I think you met him when we were all kind of hanging around the zone, the sports yeah. talk radio station when we yeah. were out 280. Yep. He would co-host my show with me often, and then you started doing it. Oh, and then Carrie we Estes would come in. Carrie. Carrie's the one I think brought us all together. Anyway, good segment with Hamp as always. Got a couple of notes and, and a couple of loose ends we need to tie out as we close out the Tuesday edition of Big Noon Sports. Town to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. It is presented by Haley Sansing Union Home Mortgage. It's Matt, Lars, Justin. A big story out of Texas concerning Quinn Ewers. Um, he was given a week-to-week designation on the team's injury report. He suffered a shoulder injury in this past Saturday's 31-24 to win at Houston. Now, it doesn't look like he's going to play this weekend. So who do they go to? Nah, not so fast. It's not ours. They're going to Malik Murphy. And Sarkeesian was pretty defined about that when he made the announcement yesterday. He said, uh, he's our guy, comma, dot, dot, dot. And Arch may figure in. I'm not surprised at all by this, Lars. No. um, You know, if, uh, I mean, look, you got to go with the more experienced player. And, uh, and, 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 And Murphy has that. He's a natural 
passer. Uh, he can make all the throws and all of that, uh, all of that stuff. But uh, and and I, I just think you you don't want to throw Arch out there. They're going. To, they're playing against BYU. Uh, BYU's down a little bit from what they normally are. Uh, but hey, if you're a if you're an Alabama fan, root hard for BYU because the nightmare scenario is for Texas to win the uh, uh, win the Big Twelve and be a one loss team, and have Alabama win the SEC as a one loss team, and you know who's going to get in if they're competing for the fourth slot in the playoffs. So you want Texas to lose, uh, and uh, doubt that will happen, but. Uh, Quinn Ewers is just a fantastic player, fantastic player. Um, and uh, look, they were very lucky, very lucky to beat Houston on Saturday night. It was uh, surprising. But Ewers suffered a grade two AC joint sprain in his throwing shoulder. And uh, he could miss multiple weeks. You just never really know when you have a, a, that AC joint sprain, uh, especially in your throwing shoulder. Is is he a little brittle? He's a big kid, uh, but yeah, yeah, he's injury prone for yeah, sure. I always hate saying that, but sometimes you just have to tell it because because yeah, it's true. I mean, yeah, you know, he, it was uh, true. It was true when I was in little league. There were some kids that would just get hurt. You know, yeah, it's a different chemical body makeup, I guess. I it's just it is strange. But you're right. Just some people are more prone to injury than others. And that's why it's just, uh, you know, when the NFL scouts and GMs are analyzing college players, they are always looking at the injury history, you know, because cause typically if a, if a guy suffers multiple injuries in college, that, t- that usually carries over. And um, I, I don't really know the reason for it. But this is the second year in a row that Ewers is going to miss time because, as we know, he sprained that clavicle joint uh, against Alabama last year. And then he ended up missing the next three games. And so this is the second second season in a row that he's going to miss at least one, possibly more games. Um, are you, I don't know. Are, are you surprised that Arch Manning isn't getting the start? No. I'll bet his NIL contributors are a little hacked off about it because they need more. They want more exposure. They're paying the guy a lot of money, but um, he's not ready. And don't put him out there if he's not ready. I mean, don't take your five star, four star, or I guess in some places he dropped to a three star after he didn't uh, sign with Alabama. But um, you can't put and a kid like that into a situation. No. Uh, and. Malik and, Murphy's a better quarterback right now. I mean, that's pretty much what yeah. Sarkeesian said, right? Yeah. And Arch played at Isidore Newman. And I know that's where Peyton played and that's where Eli played. But Isidore Newman does not play good competition. And so, it, and look, what we're seeing at the left tackle spot, right, at Alabama, uh, with the kid coming out of Iowa, playing Iowa high school football, trying to play SEC football, it's a huge jump. And it's the same thing for for Arch Manning. And uh, I mean, I, I've talked to several people that they're just, they're not sure that Arch Manning is going to be, there's the, and it's gotta be so hard for him because the expectations are so high. You know, Archie Manning, who I absolutely love, but he did, I think he made a mistake uh, about five years ago declaring that Arch is gonna be the best one yet. Uh, and that, and people remember that. And so um, I think uh, Sarkeesian, who, could, who obviously knows how to manage quarterbacks is, is making the right call here. Wow, they have a, a rather impressive list coming out of Isidore Newman. Uh, and not just the Mannings the way I'm reading this and several others but we have got to uh, dart out of here Lars <clears throat> you can watch some baseball with me tonight I am going to be teaching tonight I'm heading yeah. down to I'm heading down to Tuscaloosa uh, right now right after, now after yeah I got some things I got to take care of but uh, looking forward to it and uh, we'll do it again tomorrow 22 hours and uh, let's remind everybody that 
will be at Innisfree Friday. Place to be. Well, it's a place to be right now, if you ask me. All right, uh, Lars, thank you. Justin, thank you. have a great you, day, and we'll do it again in 22 hours.